for they are joining. Can we start, Crystal? So good evening to all, and we are very happy to welcome all of you to today's seminar. Now, as you may all know that this lecture is the second in the series of seminars organized as part of commemorating 40 years of CWDS. We are really privileged to have you all, all, of, all of you with us today. Uh, we are really obliged to all your support. And I know today there are multiple events happening almost the same time. And uh, I'm happy that you have found time to attend our lecture. Uh, you know, uh, though uh, the pandemic has pushed ourselves into the world of uncertainties, the only advantage possibly is what uh, we can think is that we have uh, now we can invite speakers who otherwise are not accessible to us because of the distance, the travel, all that related uh, you know, issues. We are really thankful to Crystal Simeone for agreeing to be our speaker for this month. Uh, uh, Crystal is the director at NAVI, the African Feminist Macroeconomics Collective. She's also on the board of the Institute of Public Finance, IPF, Kenya, and a member of uh, a, a number of reference groups related to gender and macroeconomic policy. She has previously served as the head of advocacy and lead on economic justice at FEMNET, which is one of the, uh, the Africa's largest women's rights networks, uh, which has over 300 members and it spread over 45 African countries. She led Fepnant's work to ensure that women from Africa have the capacity to articulate their issues through a pan-American feminist macroeconomic lens. Prior, her, prior to her working at, uh, at Fepnant, she has worked as policy lead for the thematic area on international financial architecture at the Tax Justice Network, Africa. She has also worked for HIVOS, East Africa, where she played a critical role in subnational, national and regional policy discussions and partner management. She has been working for a long time on the themes of inequalities, including economic inequality and gender inequality in macroeconomic policies, and has also involved with work around data. Other than her academic contribution, it's her experience and inputs as an activist which makes us very special for this lecture, special for us to invite her. A warm welcome to her. Uh, the title of today's uh, talk is Health PPPs through Global Finance, a Feminist Anal Analysis, where she will be looking at financing of public services in, in this context health, where she will be uh, basically analyzing the systematic and comprehensive efforts to promote public, uh, private sector uh, development uh, this is uh, you know, done in the context of Kenya. The Indian story, I'm sure, will not be too different, and there will be multiple overlaps as we discuss the issue, I'm sure. Before I request uh, Crystal to speak, I request all participants to, keep, uh, to please keep your audio muted. Uh, after the lecture, which will be for uh, 40 minutes to one hour, uh, we will have an open discussion. Uh, participants could write, put their comments in the, uh, the chat box that is there, or could actually speak after the lecture and by unmuting themselves. And, uh, you know, uh, and it could be a direct interaction with the speaker. The lecture is also live telecasted on YouTube, and it is also being rep recorded, and it will be available on YouTube later, in the CWDS YouTube link later. So I'm, I look forward to a good discussion and over to uh, Krista, thank you. Thank you so much, Nitha. Um, it's such an honor, such a pleasure to be here. I hope you can hear me okay. If you can't make a- Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. We can hear you. Okay. Um, as Nitha said, my name is Crystal. I am based in Nairobi, Kenya. I am so, so honored to be here. I've been watching The Suitable Boy on Netflix. So I feel like um, I've been watching a little bit of Indian and India's history a little bit through the lens of, of the show. So it's so it's it's such an honor to be here amongst all of you and to see some familiar faces or rather names on the list. Um, um, I feel I feel warmly welcomed. Um, so I'll start off a little bit with, my name is Crystal, like I said, I'm based 
a Pan-African, Nitha not Pan-American, but Pan-African issues um, that meet at the intersection of a Pan-African feminist analysis of macro level economic policy. And these are primarily issues around debt, around tax, around trade, for example, around the growing idea of financialization and what it means for African women. Um, I am not an academic, so it's such an honor to be here, but I'm an, I'm an activist. I sometimes dabble in academic research and writing, but really my work revolves around influencing both African policy spaces as well as global policy spaces from the lenses in which I sit. Please increase the volume of the speaker. Uh, thank you. I, I'll try and speak a little, little bit louder. When I speak about important things, I tend to dip my voice. Thanks for pointing that out. Um, I've just started an initiative called Nawi, which is six months old. Uh, we've just had a debut on Twitter today, so you can follow us there. I'll put the, the, the link in the, in the chat box later. And it works primarily around these issues of giving really a narrative from an African feminist perspective to these very globally important issues. Um, and ones that, the ones that really haven't had too much attention. Every time you talk about the economy and women, there's always usually a skew towards uh, microeconomic issues, so financial inclusion, microcredit. Um, but women's lives cannot be always led in micro ways. And so it's important to make sure that we're influencing these macro issues that have such a direct impact on the lives of all of our African women and girls. And so to start off with, I will um, start with a quote by Winnie Bayanima, uh, former director of Oxfam. And she says, it is women crushed at the bottom of a global economic heap whose poverty powers the supposed success of globalization. And this rings true in so many ways, and it sort of sets the stage for what I will be speaking about and so much of the work that I do. And really, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And so I will start with taking us back a little bit. But I will say the last decade has seen Africa's narrative move from the very dark continent to one where we have been headlined by many publications with a new narrative that reads Africa rising. The continent bo boasted of a steep GDP growth and images of skyscrapers and frog leaping technology, which was widely celebrated. From Africa's silicone savannas to groundbreaking mobile money, we were at the very top of our game, or so it seemed. So it seemed because in tandem, so it seemed because in tandem with the rise of our GDP, so did our levels of inequality. Africa is the second most unequal continent in the world and home to seven of the most unequal countries. The richest 0.0001% of our Africans own more than 40% of wealth of the entire continent, so, does, so Oxfam says. Africa's three richest billionaire men have more wealth than the bottom 50% of the population of Africa, which is approximately 650 million people. It is also clear that there is inequalities within the inequality because those three richest men are actually men. And so you can see, begin to see the discrepancies between gender even in, in our inequalities. The World Bank, which I don't usually refer to, but I will hear, estimates that 87% of the world's extreme poor will be in Africa by 2030. And if current trends continue, and now with the pandemic, that number will definitely be worse. But let's pan back a little bit. And because as the song says, the more things change, the more they stay the same. As we all know, Africa went through a deeply violent and extractive colonial period, a history that India shares and knows all too well. It is estimated that the slave trade alone accounted for trillions worth of an injection, trillions of dollars worth of an injection into the global North economy from free slave labor that ostensibly fueled their industrial revolution, from free labor to grow cotton and, 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 and cane for their calories as well as their textile commodities. But aside from the free labor, there was commodities and, and, and extraction of, of from minerals to agricultural outputs that fueled economies in the North. From this, we begin to see that from, for this hegemonic economic system to exist, something and many a time someone must subsidize it. And it continues in the same trajectory with women's labor currently subsidizing many of our states from the unseen labor that we all do. And COVID has shown this in a very, very clear way. For so long, the backbone of our economies has been and continues to be um, supported by women's labor. 
Essential workers has, however, been tax advisors and bankers. But with COVID, we begin to see who really is holding up our economies, our societies, our nations, our world. Taking care of children, all taking care of old people, doing the backbreaking work that is constantly invisibilized and underpaid, or many a times not even paid. But it is us who are now at the front lines of our economies as COVID brings our very same economies to its knees. And suddenly, tax advisors and bankers are not nearly as important as we imagined them to be. But after our colonial and slave trade period, we found freedom as a continent. Well, again, so we thought. Um, we had control of our own states as we thought, and post-colonial administration seemed to be taking our newly independent countries into a new era of prosperity. Newly independent countries had people-centered economies that were led by the likes of the great Thomas Sankara, Nyerere from Tanzania, Kuruma from Ghana. And in as much as Africa seemed to be on the rise, we began to be crippled by foreign debt. Thomas Sankara at an African Union summit famously put it, in quotes, if we do not pay, the capital lenders will not die. If we do pay, we will die, and we cannot pay, and we don't want to pay. And Sankara died shortly after this, and it's hard not to draw certain conclusions as to why fueled by a global economic landscape. And this continues to show Africa's centrality in a global economy and its continued place as a site of extraction for a global North economy. We then move into the 80s and 90s that saw the structural adjustment programs, a range of neoliberal macroeconomic measures promoted by the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund in exchange for financial resources. Kenya was amongst the majority of countries in sub-Saharan Africa in which the SAPs were implemented with really devastating effects on the delivery of public services, stemming from cuts in public, um, uh, stemming in stemming from cuts in government expenditure imposed on the public sector. So areas such as healthcare, education, our textile industry in Kenya, for example, was brought to, to its knees. It's widely documented how the economic and social impact of the structural adjustment programs disproportionately affected women. The collapse of publicly delivered social services and infrastructure increased their unpaid care and domestic work burdens and low skilled public sector jobs which mainly employed women were lost. User fee payments and cost sharing also fell very heavily on women. And we, we know these stories from narratives that our mothers and our grandmothers have told us. And we question the role of knowledge and what it means for knowledge to be scientific and, and our African ways of passing on knowledge, wisdom and information, which many of the time are never documented in written form. And so we really must decolonize the ways in which our information is passed and make sure that we are centralizing our women's stories and narratives of real life examples in the stories of development and the narratives of development that feed into policy making. And so we pan back to um, current day and in 2015, the world came together in, in Addis for what they call the Financing for Development Meeting. And this really was looking at how the gap in financing can be plugged to be able to realize the SDGs, which had a trillion dollars deficit in terms of funding. Basically out of that process, options for regions such as Africa for financing their development were either through domestic resource mobilization, and this will speak to you know, things around taxing, taxing ourselves, or ta tax, tax regimes so that we're able to raise as much domestic resources as we can to finance our own development. And the other alternative put forth to us was through private financing. And this really opened up a Pandora's box for global private finance to find a way to the heart of a developmental discourse. And we can see it increase as we walk through the halls of decision making through the United Nations or be it the African Union um, corridors and, and decision making spaces There's an increasing presence and influence by private finance and global private finance at that. And so the World Bank's approach has seemed to dominate this discourse through what they call the maximizing finance for development. Maria Jose from Eurodad notes that this maximizing finance approach has structured the bank's operations to, since 2017. And its implementation is an indication of the institution's commitment to increasing the involvement of private sector in development. 
An important objective is to attract trillions of dollars managed by private institutional investors to help finance the sustainable development goals as put forth in, in the Financing for Development meeting in 2015. And the idea of de-risking private finance is central to this approach. In brief, the approach questions a country's ability to say, provide healthcare. And it will question, are, your country, are there policies and legislations within your country that act as barriers for private finance to come in and invest in these gaps that would help you meet your development goals? So say healthcare, for example. And if there are, you need to, to, take, to, to remove those policies and legislation, and we can provide you technical support to, to rejig your policy frameworks to make it more attractive. Um, and because your country's economic status is still risky, um, we need to be able to attract as much private investment and by doing so you need to de-risk their private investment um, into your countries. And so government's role in, in being a de-risking state comes into question. And means, for example, in healthcare, guaranteeing a, a certain number of patients for your hospital, for example, de-risking against calamities or political strife to make sure that this private investment remains profitable. And again, this means that profit always will come before, before people. It begins to question the social contract between state and citizen and shifts the contract to one between state and global, to one moves it beyond being one between state and citizen into one between global private finance and the state. And so now I will use the case of Kenya to show you how this pans out. And in 2015, the government of Kenya launched a scheme that provided for the outsourcing of specialized medical equipment for public hospitals across the country to private sector firms through what they called the Kenya Medical Equipment Scheme. And so privatized specialized equipment like you know, dialysis machines, machines to be used in, um, in theaters, um, very specialized machines that were supposed to take our healthcare goals to the next level. Health is seen as a human right and covered in frameworks from the African Union's Agenda 2063, which is Africa's framework for development, through to the Sustainable Development Goals. We must remember that Kenya um, promulgated a new constitution in 2010, which has a devolved system of governments under governance under which healthcare sits. And so our policy making sits at a national level, but implementation of healthcare sits at a county level of which we have 46 count counties in the country. And they're in charge of developing and financing their own developmental plans for healthcare at a local county level. Um, the 2010 constitution also, it's good to remember, uh, prioritize at a very high level public participation and really has it at its core of, of how we function. And so things like budgets have to go through a public participation program. Things like developmental plans have to go through a public participation program and questions around what it means for meaningful participation rather than our governments ticking the boxes is something that we still grapple with. So just to put in context the country that I'm talking about, and Kenya is classified as a lower middle income country, so less development assistance is accrued to us because we're thought to be able to generate some domestic revenue and be able to, to sustain and finance our own development. But suddenly it means that we then have to fend for ourselves, which ostensibly means that nothing has changed. The Managed Equipment Services Scheme was a public-private partnership which said that it went into a seven-year scheme to provide specialized health equipment to 98 hospitals in Kenya um, at a county level. And the contract was done at a national level with five global companies and local private sector were only to supply consumables. However, news has shown that there have been some gray areas between the role of multinational private sector, the five global ones, which included General Electric, um, Philips, there was an Indian company actually, there was an Italian company um, and a Chinese company as well. Uh, deductions were made at source, so at a national level, and these amounted to $432 million through the seven years. In terms of budgets, um, servicing the contracts for the managed equipment scheme, which we popularly call the MES program. Um, in 2017, in terms of budget for healthcare at a national level, 
servicing this contract came third in, in budget allocation. It came up before free primary health care, for example. It was a higher spend than the rollout of universal health coverage. It was a higher spend um, than, than training doctors and, and training and paying them. It came higher than public services, public health services, which as we see through COVID is a vital area of importance in healthcare. In terms of players, uh, who was involved in the medical managed in the MES project was the World Bank, obviously, the United Nations, um, law firms, um, our national government. We have a Kenya SDG partnership platform with the World Bank. But what is really interesting is that it's very hard to tell from where we sit as, as activists and policy analysts where exactly the World Bank begins and where our government stops. Um, there's a lot of influence by the World Bank. The lawyers that have advised our governments um, have very deep entanglements with the World Bank. And so it's very hard to see what really is our policy direction versus what is the World Bank's policy direction. There has been resistance in this. Um, the, the hospitals that were supplied with these uh, specialized equipment over 70% of this equipment has been lying fallow. And the reasons are, in most of these hospitals, there isn't running water to service these machines. There isn't three-phase electricity, which is important to run these machines. But also, most importantly, there isn't requisite um, technical knowledge in terms of doctors to be able to attend and use these machines. And so five years later, six years later now, most of these machines continue to not be used, um, continue to lie fallow in storage in these hospitals, but we continue to pay through taxpayers' money for the leasing of this equipment. There have been quotes by, for example, one of the Chinese companies who said that we were we were better off if we just outright bought the machines and it would be cheaper by three times rather than this leasing out contract that we entered into. Um, in terms of resistance, it's come from unlikely corners and in the name of governors who are in charge of the counties. And they're resisting because there are their allocations to their counties are cut at source. If they had done the deals themselves, they wouldn't be so resistant, but it was done above their heads. And so they've had no say. Um, and one of them says there are times when revolution eats their own children. Governments eat its own people. This government is going to punish you more than they'll punish me. And so it brings to the fore the idea that all oppression is linked and the risk of siloing issues and struggles, which has seen the women's movement not engaging in this resistance against issues like PPPs comes up. Um, I'll just scroll to my next slide here, sorry. And so public services publicly funded and universally delivered were and continue to be in a state of collapse. And the MES program shows exactly that. With a state spending a majority of its resources, the third highest spend, as I said, in our health budget towards servicing a private sector contract um, where seven over 70% of the machinery isn't being used, with this money could have been allocated to better maternal health care, for example, access to um, SRHR services, um, th the diversion of such a huge amount of money of our budget is then is then put to question in terms of who sets agenda and who determines what priorities need to be invested in. An unequal and undemocratic extractive global economic govern system, governance system lies at the very heart of this collapse but many a time seems so far removed to be associated with a local hospital in total disrep disrepair. Further to that, in a nation in which three quarters of the population is under 35, it means that a vast majority of Kenyans see very few alternatives to private finance in order to solve public problems because they've never experienced quality public services. Much like myself, after the structural adjustment programs, as we were liberalized and as we were privatized, it's very hard for us to imagine what a quality public hospital could look like, could feel like, could be as an experience. And so for many of our young people, they will always choose a private facility over a public one. And the question of narrative is really brought to the fore. The imposition of user fees for services was indeed a colonial project. And the neo-colonial project continues to keep poor countries like mine in a private finance chokehold with poor people bearing the brunt. And not just poor people, but women.
Healthcare becomes a market and citizens become customers or clients and their rights are trampled on as governments clamber for private investment with economic growth being the unwavering ultimate goal. In all this, public-private partnerships have continuously been seen to be more costly than publicly funded services. They lack transparency in any way, are driven by profit margins, and bottom lines are virtually all risk falling on the public purse. Yet our governments continue to pursue them. But the impact on the public is not just financial. There are also major flaws concerning priority settings by governments, which I spoke about when it comes to public health. Who benefits from it and where are the biggest investments made? Um, when there's questions over prioritizing a mega highway versus a maternal hospital, questions and prioritization around what is more profitable comes first. And so really, again, it's people's lives being put in, on the back burner in, in favor of profit. Alongside these are concerns about the absence of public participation and agency in policymaking, and really the absence of women's voices, despite the fact that these policies have such a direct impact on their everyday lives. How many kilometers a woman has to walk to be able to have a safe delivery in a public service facility? Um, these are questions that need to be really focused on. A government's ability to provide a quality universal health care relies on a combination of factors. There needs to be an understanding of local community priorities, meaningful investment in co-created health strategies, and a reliance on local expertise. And we've seen that narrative over and over get ignored. Our traditional birth attendants completely sidelined when we import doctors from Cuba, as has been done in Kenya. Although the labeling and the iterations of macroeconomic interventions change through the years, the basic neoliberal and neocolonial spirit and intention remain the same. There is a perception that the feminist struggle to reject this, these notions is new, and when in fact the, the struggle goes back decades. I was reading a book by Dawn the other day, which was published in 1985, and all the thoughts that I have seem to be new and exciting and, and, and chained and, you know, dynamic. But really, it's the exact same narratives as women in the movement have had for generations. And so sometimes I can't help but wonder if, 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 if the greats like Gita Sen must be so bored of the things that we're talking about, where I'm here uh, bright eyed and shiny and thinking that everything is so new and these problems are new, but really they're very much the same. And in reimagining feminist futures, we need to revisit and build upon a knowledge base that we've continuously had, continuously spoken about, continuously fought to have heard, and apply it to our current context and be more intentional in connecting struggles. And so really we see that every time history repeats itself, the price really does go up. And so as much as we have come, have come from a long history from our colonial um, space through to the structural adjustment programs with the Washington consensus, we're now in a new era, which some the likes of Daniela Gabor call the Wall Street cons consensus, which really financializes all aspects of life. It's a struggle that we have to connect to other struggles. The public-private in, in the PPPs, a private is always a multinational company. Hardly ever will there be a conversation about local private companies coming in partnership with, with government in meaningful ways that can change our developmental tra trajectories. And so there's questions around if there is actually space for private sector in our development. Should we really just throw out PPPs as a concept out um, and, and burn it all down? Or is there ways to make sure that the frameworks um, that we have are harmonized within our countries, within our regions in the global south, um, to make it in ways that we work for us? Or are we saying that there needs to be a revolutionary act of saying absolutely no to these, to these um, PPPs? Um, I will stop there, Nitha. I see there's a number of people who need to go. And I'm sorry I didn't read my messages. I hope I was audible to all. Um, I would really like to have a conversation because I know we share the same struggles. I know we share the same financialization models um, through the World Bank and the Maximizing Finance for Development um, model. Um, healthcare is something that has really been 
completely been deconstructed by the structural adjustment programs and continues to be done so in a very neo-colonial and neoliberal um, way through the Wall Street consensus, through the rising influence of private finance and, and global private finance at that. Um, it's interesting to see that one of the private companies that's investing in Kenyan healthcare is Indian and what that means for our ties and our relations with each other. Um, it's interesting to see and hear what we can do to put pressure on, you know, private sector companies in India and what they what they what their impact has on on the continent of Africa and countries such as mine. So I will hand over to Nitha to probably um, moderate a Q&A or really just a conversation and a sharing of, of ideas and solidarity building between all of us. Thank you, Crystal. I think you can continue if you would like to speak a little more. Uh, you could continue because uh, people will be uh, quitting and then they may join later and they could watch the YouTube recording. So if you would like to take some more time and elaborate on a specific case within Kenya and to see how that is actually that what that meant in terms of privatization. It will be interesting. Otherwise, we could open it for discussion. Don't worry about people leaving because that will happen in all, uh, you know, uh, webinars. Yeah. So maybe in the next iteration, can I, is it possible to take a few questions and I can speak to that and weave it into the next phase of my presentation? Fine. No problem. So, uh, so let us uh, you know, request participants to maybe come up with questions or share comments in terms of comparative understanding of India and Kenya. I am sure there will be a lot of uh, uh, you know, inputs to be shared here. Can I ask a question? Yes, please, Rajni. Yeah, um, yeah. Crystal, thank you for your talk. And I actually have questions where I'm would like to hear a little bit more about the Kenyan situation. And in terms of two issues in particular, one, if is there a public health advocacy movement? And in that movement, which are the, you know, what are the sorts of sections who join in? What are the issues which they raise? And again, in terms of the women's movement in Kenya, you've indicated some of the issues which you wish that the women's movement in Kenya would raise and which may not have been. But what are the sort of health issues and public health issues which women's groups in Kenya are focusing on and are raising, particularly in terms of the concerns which you've expressed, which are, of course, very much, as you indicated, common concerns for us here. Okay. Uh, Crystal, do you want to? Uh... Yeah, I can take those. Yeah. Um, yeah. So in terms of, and, and this is what I, I spoke to when I spoke about the importance of connecting struggles, um, because all oppression is linked. And so what we do see is there's a siloing. I heard that that's not an actual word, but we use it so often it's become sort of normal in my language. There's a siloing of, of struggles and issues. So if there's an organization working on public health, for example, it will just work on that. If there's one working on, uh, I don't know, budgets, it's just working on that or on tax justice. And so I think and, and issues such as PPPs really amalgamate a combination of different entry points and struggles. And so there is a public health care movement, but primarily from a cusp. And, and again, this, this points out to issues from a customer perspective, because most of our healthcare, a lot of it is privatized. And so there's a rising movement in terms of um, healthcare advocacy in, in overcharging at private healthcare facilities and things like that. But in terms of an actual public health advocacy movement, um, there is some for sure, but definitely not in depth and not ones that tie into issues such as budgets budget allocations. They're very specific ones within the women's movement that will speak to maternal health care and access to SRHR services and, and goods. But they will not, what I, what I recognize is that they don't usually link issues, especially of a macroeconomic issue. And so within the context of public-private partnerships with a, with a case study that I presented, with the issue of there lacking so much transparent, there completely isn't any transparency and doing any research, actually, you feel you sort of feel like an investigative journalist. And it's it's sort of, you know, you have to meet people and have them 
disclose things at bars, for example, or over a coffee that you can't really quote if you're researching or writing um, about this case. And so citizens don't know. Um, they have no idea what our government has signed up for. They have no idea what terms. They have no idea how much money that we're paying for. They don't even know that the contract exists because they it's it's so out of their realm. It's these these specialized equipments are locked up in stores somewhere, um, and so they have no access to the knowledge that it is their taxpayers' money that is for funding these these contracts. The women's movement can be fragmented at times, um, and I think this also has to do with the funding landscape. For so many years, funding to the women's movement has been lacking in general, but when it does come, it's for very specific project, um, project specific work. And so it discourages a women's movement from really delving into what can, what can be linked to what our our deeply ingrained problems are. Um, there isn't funding to explore and really work and connect issues and struggles in the work that we do as the women's movement within a country like Kenya and across the continent of Africa, for example. And so you'll find pockets of, of you know, birth and a lot of uh, bilateral organizations will also, in terms of healthcare, fund very vertical, vertical interventions. They will come and fund just um, malaria or HIV AIDS, for example, and without a horizontal approach to funding healthcare and interventions, um, it becomes hard for a country to develop its health systems as a whole. And we're seeing the repercussions of this model now through COVID. Um, in Kenya, for example, a lot of our public health is run, knowledge and data is held by bilateral organizations and funding partners like DFID or USA programs, because the best outcome of public health is that nothing happens. There isn't anything sexy to show that, you know, you stopped this and this is the result. Um, the best outcome of public health and a functioning public health is um, system is that people are healthy and they're not sick and people, you know, nothing happens, nothing drastic happens. And that boring, hard labor of work of making sure that there are community health workers in every community that can, you know, gather information and know what's happening on the ground. That framework does not belong to us and we don't have any control over that. So that's a very worrying trend in terms of the, the ways in which development finance um, has an impact on, on how we organize and, and resist oppression in this very neoliberal, neo-capitalist way. Um, it, it fragments the movement, both in terms of the women's movement, but it also fragments funding into where, in, it fragments funding that should be funded, funding horizontal approaches to developmental problems rather than siloing issues um, that mean that we're not really moving in the space and ways that we should be. Um, there's a question in the chat. Yeah. Can you read it, Kristen? Yes, I can. Um, there's extensive lack of transparency on MES contracts, payments, and the state of equipment despite media attention, how would you see a coalition among health activists, feminists, and other in civil society changing that situation? I think, um, and this, a lot of what I've spoken about is, is um, inspired by a paper that myself and a colleague, Wangari, Wangari Kinoti, um, wrote for Dawn, Development Alternatives for Women in a New Era, that should be coming up in the next few months. As we research for the paper, and it goes it goes very in depth into it. Um, like I said before, there's a complete lack of transparency um, in terms of what government is doing. Not only a complete lack of transparency, but it's it's very it's very clear that there's a very central role that the World Bank is playing uh, to facilitate uh, country developmental policies and legislative frameworks. Um, to be skewed towards an attraction to private finance, again, global private finance. And this means that it is done at the expense of our own local indigenous companies, if private, private companies need to be engaged. Um, but really, nobody knows, like I said, what's going on. I think the first issue that we, that we should be able to, to to use to resist is a freedom of information, is our Freedom of Information Act, which I know India has and has been using, you know, 
quite well and, and to a very large extent, very successfully so. Um, we need to be able to have access to these contracts and open them up. Uh, the managed equipment scheme in Kenya has been um, investigated at a Senate level. There's been a lot of political, you know, back and forth around the process. There's a lot of money involved, uh, as you can imagine. There's a lot of interest by political elite within the managed equipment scheme project and contracts. And so it's very, very murky waters. Um, there's some high level politicians and, and, and leaders really that have been implicated in, 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 in the project. Um, and so one really questions what happens if the, you know, the idea of public private partnerships really puts forth the idea that the African, an African state is incapable of providing services and goods for its people and citizens. But in the absence of our states not providing for our people, how then do you straddle the two um, where we're pushed against a wall by a global finance system that is so skewed against us and is so extractive in nature? In fact, Jason Hickel, uh, the economist, says that there's there's an apartheid in the global governance system in terms of who makes decisions and who influences policy decisions that affect all of us. And Africa, for example, doesn't sit at the OECD that makes the global frameworks for tax, for example, yet we are the, you know, we lose over a hundred billion dollars in illicit financial flows every year through, you know, tax evasion, um, through all sorts of tax manipulation but we don't sit at the table that can that we can have influence over to make sure that we remain with our fair share of taxation and that we can have our taxing rights and that our domestic resource mobilization is actually um, is actually possible. And so I think the first thing is the second thing is to is to be loud about a lack of transparency and pushing back and questioning um, companies like General Electric that was in that was one of the five companies in Kenya with a managed equipment scheme was thrown out of Brazil for a lack of transparency. And I think the onus is on us to make sure that we're connecting these dots outside of our own little um, outside of our own you know case studies and and countries and really find ways to across regions because the same thing is happening all across over and over it might differ in in terms of how it manifests but really at the core of it is a very extractive profiteering agenda that really needs to be changed um i think also and this is the work that that now is doing is making sure that the women's movement is talking about macro level economic issues, that we understand it, that we're changing the narrative, that we're decolonizing the narrative. So much of, of, of the issues that happen to us in terms of economic policy from trade to tax to debt, most of that information is written scientifically, not really by us and definitely not by African women. And it's the onus is on us to make sure that we're continuously writing, that we're continuously documenting both in terms of oral documentation, but also written and scientific academic documentation uh, to be influencing, you know, regional processes, but also global economic processes. Our voices need to be central, but we need to be able to connect the dots to, to the work that's being done, but also the extractive policies that are being implemented upon us. Um, there are other questions also. Uh, yes. One from yes. There's one from mm -hmm. Mala Kuller. Uh, she basically has asked about uh, women specific health needs like reproductive adolescent girls, infant care, mother and children. Those, uh, how are these advocacy, women's advocacy, advocacy groups uh, taking up these issues? So again, it, it speaks to the question of siloing issues. And there are definitely a, a very robust women's movement in on the continent, in, in Kenya specifically, that are working towards increasing funding to reproductive health care, um, infant care, maternal health. Kenya has a free maternal um, program. Somebody made me laugh the other day and said the government is providing free access to nothing because 
I mean, the, 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 the policy is, but when you do go to a hospital, you have to come with your own gloves, your own um, surgical blades, your own cotton wool, your own buckets. And so basically you're, you know, subsidizing a government hospital, yet they claim that it's a free maternal health care. And so questions around, you know, the devil is always, always in the details. And our governments, especially mine in Kenya, is very well known for giving very flowery announcements of what they're doing. But if you open it up and dig a little bit deeper, really what we're getting is almost nothing. And the maternal health care situation is very much the same. Um, I think, like I said before, the question around advocating for maternal health care needs to be backed by who's funding um, maternal health care, for example. Kenya has built this huge uh, standard gauge rail that is costing us almost 7% of our GDP in debt. Uh, this rail that we are going to have to pay for for generations. Uh, but who does it service is questionable. If does it link market women to fresh produce or, or smallholder farmers to market women? No, it doesn't. And so questions again in terms of priorities and who's setting the agenda and linking these needs to be done. And so we can't be advocating for maternal care if we don't connect struggles to budgets, towards the freedom and sovereignty of us being able to finance our own development without questioning the role and centrality of private, global private finance in our developmental agenda. And so if a maternal hospital doesn't seem profitable enough, it just gets put off the table in terms of what is possibly invested in, in favor for a mega infrastructure like a mega highway. Um, and again, the question around if the economy isn't working for its people, then who exactly is it working for? Um, the economy is really so closely and intimately tied to our everyday lives and the quality and dignified quality of, of our everyday lives. What hospital am I able to take my children to? What, 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 what schools am I able to take my children to? What hospitals can I have my, my babies in? Um, and the questions around a double taxation in the fact that I do pay all my taxes, even if you don't have a, you know, a pay slip and, and, and a pay as you earn tax, we pay it in you know, everything that we buy in terms of value added tax. But the, the correlation and the narrative with citizens to know that this they have paid their dues. And so there is a social contract that should accrue public services of a universal um, type back to them. There's a missing link there. And so connecting the struggles between, you know, SRHR, infant care, um, and those sorts of campaigns has to be very strongly interlinked with questions of financing and questions of a global economic governance system that continuously undermines our ability to provide for these very same services. There's another question from uh, Dr. Vandana Amira Shiva, uh, where uh, she has basically reinforced or uh, suggested that agreed to what all you have made in terms of the points that you have made it in terms of uh, funding uh, healthcare. But she has two questions. One is related to the privatization of medical education in India uh, and how is it in Kenya. The second is uh, with regard to the role of IT and it, it's entering the health sector. Yeah, so funny enough, um, uh, India is the go-to for, for um, medical tourism for a lot of Kenyans. Um, uh, going to India for treatments around cancer, surgery is many, many times cheaper than it is in our own pri private hospitals. And I had a conversation with an Indian colleague and she was really, you know, really weirded out by this idea that Kenyans are traveling all the way to India um, and that your healthcare is actually cheaper than our private healthcare. Uh, it just points out to our whole system being in complete disarray. Um, my mom broke her arm a few weeks ago and trying to get an x-ray for her from the private, you know, the Ken Nairobi's top private facilities, we had to go to three different ones because they, they had been broken down, which speaks to a regulation of the industry as a whole, both public and private. Um, in terms of medical training, uh, it's such a huge, I don't even know where to start. And I've been working with the medical practitioners for a very long time. Um, We've got a very robust training uh, system in terms of university or medical training in, in, in the country. 
but our training and what they're trained for versus what our doctors meet when they actually become doctors has a huge disconnect. Um, and a, a few doctor friends of mine have quit the practice and said, I wasn't trained to watch over people dying. In terms of what facilities they have and what medicines they have accessible, um, what machinery and tools they have, whether they have just running water, for example, or electricity, there are stories of our doctors having to um, do um, cesarean sections with the help of a mobile phone torch, right? And so, you know, questions around their remuneration and how lowly they're paid, but at the same time, our government importing in the very same way as you would import commodities, importing doctors from Cuba, when we have an oversupply of doctors, but an undersupply in terms of our government's ability to pay and fairly pay our doctors that are working all over the country, but also our nurses and our clinical officers. What that means is that there's a huge um, movement of our trained doctors out of the country. I think at one point there was more Kenyan doctors in Europe than we had in, in, in Kenya. And this is basically because doctors have to survive and they have to live and their livelihoods um, are not supported by what they get from government. Um, what it also means is that we're exporting knowledge that we have spent taxpayers' money training for, um, and they will, you know, as, as as soon as they get a chance, will leave the country or leave the practice in in favor of something that they can earn a decent living out of, um, which means that the ratio of doctors to patients is very very dismal in the country. There has been demonstrations over demonstrations. 2018 saw the whole doctor's workforce um, strike and stop working for over a month. We had a number, quite a number of people dying, uh, hospitals brought down to their knees. Um, so the problem for us is not so much the training versus the space and, and the environment that trained doctors go into after that and are bleeding out of trained trained practitioners, trained doctors, trained nurses, trained specialists. Um, I think just five years ago, we only had seven neurosurgeons in the whole country because, you know, they just don't get paid enough. Um, so in terms of higher education for doctors, I think that's our, our biggest gap is the transition from the training into the workforce and what that means and the, and, and the environment that they're in. Um, the second question was on. Nisa, what was... I think one the question that she asked was also on uh, uh, privatization of health education. Is it uh, privatized in Kenya? Yeah, so that's what I mean. Um, so no, most of our education in terms of healthcare is still public. Um, but as I said, the the issue is the transition from the training facilities into a workforce and what that workforce looks like, which is our biggest uh, predicament right now. Um, and the role of IT entering healthcare. So Kenya being the home of M-Pesa and, and claiming to have this uh, Silicon Savannah, um, there's a lot of there's a big narrative that puts us as a frog leaping nation in terms of using IT technologies um, to frog leap a lot of our problems. Um, it's a very dangerous one in that one, there's entry for, um, for private finance again, but secondly, even with the entry of um, IT, it means that it still stands on the very same, very problematic foundations that we continue to exist in, one that is extractive by nature. And IT can exacerbate those problems, but it definitely does very little to solve them. Um, who's developing these IT solutions and technologies needs to be questioned and asked. And there has been numerous articles of Kenya's top tech firms and who owns them. And really like 98% of them are foreign owned. And so again, in terms of connecting struggles and linkages when you talk about tax justice and if the majority of these organizations and com private companies actually are foreign owned their tax isn't being retained in the country and there's an outflow of tax there the same with multinationals it, it also it also is this very same with PPPs the very same multinationals that we're trying to make sure pay their fair share of taxes are the very same multinationals that we're saying here here's our developmental problem please help us with it um you know it it's sort of asking the wolf to help with the chickens 
uh, which sort of always puts us in trouble. So I'm very cautious in terms of having IT as a silver bullet to all our problems, which is sort of a lot of the time the narrative that is used on us. Um, as, I get, as I said again, unless the root causes and the structural causes of so much of our oppression is, is looked at, the entry of IT might just only exacerbate the problems in ways that are completely out of our control. Um, so I think we have to go back to square one and really question our place and our space in a global governance economic system, um, question what that means for us and question how we can begin to, to shift the needle there. Um, and the question of IT can only come after that. Uh, There are more questions on the chat. Yeah. Um, can I share pub details about the publication? Yes, I can. Uh, Dawn will be publishing a compendium, and I see other people on this call that have contributed to the to to the compendium um, of case studies in a number of countries. I think there was one from India. There's one from Senegal, one from Ghana, one from Zimbabwe, one from Kenya, and a number of others. Fiji, I think. And so they will be put together. Um, uh, my co-author and myself have done a webinar, which I can put a link to, sorry, not a webinar, a podcast, which I can put a link to, um, speaking to the paper. Um, I don't really know when the launch of the actual compendium and, and, and collection of and how allies around the world can support the launch to ensure it gets as wide readership. Mm -hmm. Could you speak about how the private healthcare sector in Kenya has responded to the COVID context? Yeah, so that's really an interesting one. Um, and if you remember, I spoke about our healthcare space having very vertical interventions by bilateral donors such as USAID. I don't know if I should be saying the actual names, but I will because I'm, I'm an activist. Um, and so this has been largely problematic. What COVID has shown is that, um, and I have this conversation a lot of the time, COVID didn't create a problem. It only showed us the underbelly of a huge problem that existed, um, probably exacerbated the, un the showing of the underbelly, but really all of these systemic problems were already so deeply ingrained in our economies. The unequal way that we run our economies and, and the centralization of profit over people constantly and consistently in the way we engage. Um, and this has come to, to bear really, where we're seeing economies being brought to their knees. I think countries like Spain, for example, have renationalized private hospitals because there's an understanding now that public healthcare can't be private. It has to be under the control of the state um, for many a reason. Um, control over data and, 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 and being able to um, provide for all citizens equally. Um, universal access is a question. And so our healthcare system, like many other countries, has really suffered because one, our public health system is on its knees. We, our government doesn't know, doesn't have a handle in terms of what is the state, the level of, of health at a community level. How many people have diabetes, for example? How many people have high blood pressure, for example? Our governments don't know because it's so fragmented that you know people will go to small private health facilities because if you remember our structural adjustment programs completely defunded almost completely defunded and almost deconstructed our healthcare systems our public our public systems in general but specific to this case our healthcare systems which means there's been a mushrooming of small little private facilities bigger you know private very posh very sparkly private facilities but there isn't a centralized data repository so that the government knows what's happening. What that means is with COVID attacking people with pre -con um, conditions that presuppose them to, to you know, being very sick with COVID, um, government really has no way of, of controlling that, that spread in that way. Um, but also at the same time with 
a definancing of public services and goods in the in terms of hospitals in terms of doctors that we really just don't have enough doctors we have no we we have almost not enough um um hospitals hospital beds and icu beds to our disposal to be able to to respond to covid um it's also interesting to know when at the very height of of the pandemic and i think we're going through a second wave now we had to isolate people in public schools and it was very interesting to hear a public um, reaction to this and the people who were um, isolated in public schools were really complaining about the status of public schools and the questions around well where do you think kenyan school children um, go to school because they were all about the facilities not being good enough for them but these are state financed public schools that a majority of kenyan children that can't afford private solutions to these very public problems um, will be sitting in. And so it opened up a different view and a different perception of where we are as a country and what we really have. I think um, on one hand, in terms of surveillance, there was questions around, you know, our government going in partnership with one of our biggest mobile companies, Safaricom, and having surveillance um, surveillance systems using mobile phones and questioning around what happens after COVID um, and what entryways was that to be able to track citizens in terms of questioning freedom of movement, freedom of expression, the freedom to privacy as well, and who has, you know, a private entity owning all this data um, in the guise of governments being able to follow up on citizens and being able to track um, movements to be able to curb the spread of COVID was really questionable. The cost implication as well, there was, we got to a point where I think a government test cost the government 50 US dollars um, and they ran out of reagents and funding to be able to do mass testing. I don't. They said they were doing mass testing, but I think we've only managed to test a maximum of maybe 1200 people per day. Um, and the private facilities were testing, but put a charge of $100 to the test. And so questions of access again and who's able to access the test um, are really central to the conversation. COVID is really in a very interesting, as much as it's been so destructive, has been really interesting in opening up conversations in different ways, many of which feminists have been pushing. And so suddenly issues such as care work, for example, is, is put on the table. So two months ago, one of our counties opened up its very first market uh, daycare facility, fully funded by, by the Kenyan government at that level and not by a bilateral or anything. And so there's a sort of understanding of things in a different way. Once our government realized that they don't have enough hospital beds, for example, they then quickly um, announced that they're going for a home-based care strategy as an approach. But again, questions about who do you think is taking care of these sick COVID patients, um, that does not get recognized. And so there is an acknowledgement of care work, for example, that feminists have been talking about. But again, the detailing of it in terms of do you give women, it's mostly women who are taking care of the sick and how, in what ways are, there, are they being supported to carry the burden that the, the government has again, once again, put on women and abdicated its role from. Um, so yeah, it's been a really interesting um, experience going through COVID, uh, bringing up issues that we constantly, constantly talk about and we're constantly shut down and suddenly people are talking about it, but also reiterating some of these globally structured issues um, that have been there for millennia and generations. Uh, There's a question on women's groups, SHGs and NGOs. What is are an they... SHG? Uh, this is by Mala Kular. There are many questions, but this is, uh, you know, a question yeah. of SHGs and NGOs. Yeah. So, Whether they make any uh, difference to the whole uh, discussion. So in terms of public-private partnerships, like I said, the women's movement in Kenya hasn't 
as far as I can see, and maybe something will happen, but they haven't made any inputs yet. There hasn't been space for public participation in the signing and the negotiation of the contracts around the managed equipment scheme, um, which is a huge gap. Um, so nobody knows really, the contracts are not open for open engagement. So there hasn't been space for, um, for input, but at the same time, I haven't heard of the women's movement um, making a request for that to be made transparent. Um, and that's, I think, because sometimes issues around the economy, especially macro level economic policy can be hid around very technical jargon that really dissuades a women's movement from engaging. Um, there are technical aspects to public private partnerships, for example, or financialization, but really at the heart of the narrative and the conversation is a question of power and an imbalance of power. It's a question of where do we get, who decides where we get the money from and who decides how we spend this money. Um, and so, it's as simple and as complicated as that. Um, but I think those are the reasons why the women's movement hasn't yet um, spoken out. I have a feeling with it being so so much in our news um, and it being you know the latest scandal, there might be uh, requests or engagement by the women's movement. And it, the onus is on organizations like NAWI to make sure that there's there's a sustained voicing of issues and a sustained push for women's movements and groups to constantly connect the dots and constantly voice themselves um, and, and claim their agency in the conversation. Yeah, data protection and data mining are huge, huge issues. Now, one of the companies that was involved in, in the managed equipment scheme, um, Philips, has been working on a different PPP, working at community health at community health levels at a very, very local level um, and really mining a lot of our citizen data and questions around data protection in a country that does not have data protection laws um, is really, really worrying. There's so many issues that, like you can you can see, there's so many issues that, that are connecting. And I don't know if there's a data protection movement in the country as yet. Um, there's been a push for open data in terms of government, open government data. Um, there's been a small push around data protection, but nothing as robust and nothing as linked as, as we should be. Uh, but again, it's work in progress. And hopefully, like now that we're beginning to talk about these things, the different silos of interventions or groups are able to see the connection and see where we all meet. <clears throat> Okay, so that's uh, the question from Vijaya. Uh, she is saying that there are similar experiences in the context of India in terms of PPPs, but uh, you know she's wanting to know how was, has this model impacted healthcare workforce? Yeah, so again, um, the biggest is the government with um, services like healthcare being relegated to private sector that's questionable in terms of what that means for a large government public service workforce um, without protections from the state. Um, and so I'll give you an example. One of our biggest private hospitals um, had a cholera outbreak. And the reason why they had a cholera outbreak was because they had contractual, they had contracted a private cleaning company to provide um, cleaning um, workers. And these workers were coming from informal settlements um, without being tested, without being paid um, a living wage. Uh, and they would come in and, and they had a workaround around, there was a law, a rule that they had to constantly test the workforce, but because they were not permanent um, workers, they would come in on very short term contractual basis. And so suddenly there was a complete, you know, outbreak of cholera, which in Kenya, I don't know about in India, but there's a very high correlation between cholera and poverty um, because of sanitation. And so it was a very interesting um, way to, to bring out the correlation between a workforce that is, that is sourced from a gig economy um, for something that is so important such as healthcare. And this really speaks to a de complete deregulation of a whole health system, whether it be private or public. Um, and the workforce within it with the rise of the gig economy taking hold of all of 
a lot of our jobs, what does that mean? Um, where people come in and are billed, you know, per hour without any social security nets. Uh, what does it mean for women who are majority of our nurses? I think over 70% of Kenyan nurses are women. Um, if they're going to be engaging as, you know, in the gig economy type arrangement, what does that mean for their their own health insurance? Um, through COVID, what one of the stories that came up was a majority of Kenyan private healthcare doctors saying they weren't able to um, pay for their own COVID treatment because they they don't have health insurance themselves. Um, these are all doctors that work in our premium health facilities across the country. Um, so there's definitely questions around their safety nets, around um, their ability to earn a decent and living wage, um, and the rise of privatizing our 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 health systems has a complete, a, a direct correlation with that as an issue. Um, and yes, most, yeah, most of them will be delisted from public provisions. Um, Kenya has a very similar digital ID to the similar resistance campaigns and court cases over issues of exclusion and social welfare programs. Yes, um, I have read a little bit about, about the case in India. And I think, to be honest, I think our government looks up to India for very many things. Um, we had the same currency issue that we, that you had maybe implemented in a different way. Um, but our Huduma number, which is a digital ID. So Kenya has an ID already. Um, we also have a national health insurance fund number. We have a national social security fund number. Um, we have passports and, and the centralization of that data hasn't been done. And so they introduced what they call a Huduma number, which I think sounds very familiar to what you, what has been propositioned in the Indian context. It was interesting for us because they also partnered with MasterCard. Again, data protection and, and, and who has... Who, ha who holds our information and what are they doing with that, again, is not clear. There's been a number of court cases. Um, there have been government threats. If you don't register for your Huduma number, you will not be able to access um, public public health and, and education services, for example. There have been a number of, of uh, constitutionally based court cases questioning um, that threat, and I will still call it a threat because constitutionally, the Constitution of Kenya says that all Kenyan citizens must have access to to healthcare and education and housing and all all the rest. And so that goes in direct contradiction of our very very new constitution, which we're just beginning to 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 implement. Not just beginning, but you know we've been implementing for the last ten years. Um, and so the same questions around who is holding our data, what is the importance of this, and the threats to exclusion of access to public services and goods really comes to the fore of our Huduma number. And it would be really interesting, I think somebody asked how we can collaborate, it would be really interesting to see how we can build solidarity in terms of strategies, but also in terms of how of, of analyzing the problem when it comes to India versus Kenya, we have very, 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 very similar um, problems. Uh, the reality that many public services so this uh, question on doctors from Cuba. And, yeah. Uh, do you want me to read it out? Y you can. Yeah. So doctors from Cuba are very much in demand all over the world. And they are present in 67 countries. It is one of the Cuba's price service that is exported. Why did Kenya bring in doctors from Cuba? When you say there are doctors in Kenya who can fill in the gap. Yeah, so um, it was an interesting time in Kenyan history in terms of, of doctors. And as I said, three years ago, our doctors went on strike across the country um, because of a number of reasons. Remuneration was one, but also in terms of the environment in which they were working in was completely underfunded. And so they didn't have the instruments that they needed. They don't have access to medicines. The blood banks were, you know, almost always empty and, and very very underfinanced and so um, there was a there's a whole list of things that they had put to demand and were calling for negotiation with the government. Um, our government declined to agree and in instead of instead of that decided they were going to import Cuban doctors. 
Cuban doctors are exported as commodities. Um, our government signs an agreement to the Cuban government and they bring you know, a plane full of, of Cuban doctors. We also did the same during, during the COVID pandemic. Um, but if you question how much the actual Cuban doctors are receiving, they will be receiving the same remuneration as they would at home. So it's, it's you know, they're not really living on expatriate terms. Um, there's been huge problems in terms of language gaps. Um, outside of Nairobi, they don't speak local languages. And so there's a disconnect when they're treating Kenyan patients out that don't speak the language. There's been interesting events that have happened. I think there were two doct Cuban doctors that were kidnapped and I think still are kidnapped by Somali militants in the north of Kenya. Um, so yes, we have we have more way more trained doctors than you know that, that we need. Um, but the gap comes in remuneration and the work environment that the doctors are are working in, which means that they there's such a they just don't want to work in in the public system, and so there's such a huge um, gap. We don't have enough, but they, and it's funny we don't have enough, but they're there. They just will not work in a public um, facility. I'll give you an example in the north of Wajir. Um, the local county hospital um, hired 50 nurses, but it's such an extremely unequal, it, it's such a marginalized area that without a hardship allowance, it's really not attractive. And so only one, one of the nurses actually reported in a space where they needed 50 new nurses. And so that just shows the discrepancy between the need for doctors and and how many doctors we have and what our government offers. Um, and again, it speaks to if we're not building our health systems that we're being able to finance the fair remuneration for doctors. Um, we're not able to finance research facilities, for example. So we're not building a health system as robustly as we should. So it's a weird situation where we're having to import doctors. So there's a question about NGOs, whether NGOs are also in the private sector. Um, I'm not so sure I understand the question. Um, yeah, what is the role of NGOs and NGOs are also private sector? Maybe it means like bilateral. No, I, I think we can request uh, Susirita Roy to ask the questions and please clarify what uh, you mean by yeah, hi, uh, thanks for a lovely presentation. So I am a student and I'm working on public-private partnership uh, myself. So it's very, very uh, relatable. My question is that NGOs are also a part of the private sector, as in, in India, we call them not for profit private, but uh, you know they're not state, essentially. They can be funded by the state, and so are many private agencies. So, but they have their own um, structures and you know mm -hmm. bylaws. So, uh, do you see that NGOs have a role in Kenya and or what have been your you know experience how they have been differently acting as compared to what so-called for-profit or normal private has you know yeah so I think you mean um actual service provisioning NGOs who are actually providing a service uh, versus um, advocacy organizations in with what happens with when a government's ability to provide for its citizens is hampered. And this is through our historical trajectory, like the structural adjustment programs, which saw our public services really brought to its knees. Somebody needs to fill in that gap. And, and that can be private sector. It has been the church, for example, in some parts of the country, 80% of education and healthcare facilities are run by mission, mission like churches. Um, and so NGOs will also typically fill in this gap, especially for things like maternal health care, SRHR, um, infant care, things like that. Um, I think the question that we should be asking is in terms of who regulates what they're doing and how it fits into a country's developmental plan. Um, otherwise, what happens as is seen that is happening here, um, the mushrooming of, of NGOs that provide services um, come up and pop up in different places. There's no control over where they're coming up and what need they're, they're speaking to or, or, or targeting. 
Um, but it also means that there isn't a universal approach to providing. And so some citizens might have access in from specific parts of the country, um, but that's not the case for all. The quality of services that is providing, again, is there any regulation around around that? Um, there might be theoretically, but in practice, not not really. There's been, you know, the upper uprise of organizations like I don't know if you've heard of Bridge International that's providing um, education in informal um, and marginalized communities. Um, they are working with teachers that don't have to be qualified teachers as long as you can read because what they do is they provide a script um, for the curriculum and what they call a teacher will just stand in front of the classroom and read out. Um, but again, pedagogy goes beyond just transferring knowledge. Teaching is not just reading out from a script. There's a lot that goes into it. These teachers are bringing up the next generation of citizens. And there's a lot more that goes into, the, into those things. And so without regulation, I think they can be detrimental. I think if there's, there's a way in which governments can push them to fit within our developmental trajectories with a lot more regulation, maybe there's space for them. But as it stands, it can be very risky. And um, to an extent when international NGOs are, are implementing in our country that many a times feels experimental. Um, and I question that. And I question if they would do the very same things in their own countries. Um, somebody spoke about, we can't be innovating around public policy. In the global north, I don't innovate around switching on a light switch or opening a tap for water. Why must we do the same here? And why must we be experimenting with very vital issues around people's lives like health and education? Um, so I'm wary, um, but they do exist and, and they have, you know, been plugging gaps that have existed. Um, but like all things, I think we must be careful. I also see Corina here. It's so great to have her here. Um, and she says that they are in the final stages of edita editing the case studies and the, the Compedium, which is a book, will be out soon and they will let us all know. Uh, there is a long uh, message from uh, Anna Maricot. Uh, so I think there's one by Vanita. But, oh, no, sorry. That was, okay. uh, it's about the Dawn report and the Dawn materials that are available. Yeah. Yeah. So then there's a response from Anna Maricot to where uh, she has sang and then uh, and she uh, has uh, kind of emphasized the need to kind of bring greater uh, what you call uh, networking and uh, networking for for uh, you know kind of having coalitions for the structural injustice you want me to read it no i think i don't think it was a question more so a comment okay fine so i can speak if you can hear me yes Please. Yeah, it was just, hi, it's Anna here. I was just um, reflecting and, and, and welcoming your focus on the structural injustices and the global, you know, the issues of global governance on these partnerships being so critical. Um, and I, I work on these issues from a health perspective, but seeing them happening in other sectors, like you mentioned, education, but also water and the care sector in the UK, for example, is being increasingly financialized, um, extraction of profit to the detriment of both uh, carers, but also um, patients um, and residents in the, in, within the care sector as well. Um, and it just strikes me that while we have to build a movement within health, I think we also need to stretch our arms across the sectors and think about building the movement more broadly against this financialization. Um, so it was just a comment, um, but um, I don't know whether you have any direct experience of these kind of, of, the, of, of uh, people across sectors coming together against this financialization problem. 
Um, as usual, the feminists are always at the forefront of everything. I don't know why people don't listen to us, um, but organizations like Dawn and Karina is on this call have started this work of um, bringing together people across sectors, focusing on, for example, this book that's coming out is specifically on PPPs and it has case studies from you know, market PPPs in Ghana to healthcare, um, a lot on healthcare actually. Um, and it begins to bring together how the very same systemic issues that emanate from an unequal global system of governance um, come out and manifest across different parts of the global south. We have very many things in common and the case studies all have very, very clear linking threads. They might manifest differently in different sectors, but definitely at the core of it, the power structures and the questionings around that power structure um, with, with a skew towards profiteering for the global north is constantly and very loudly linked. Uh, and I think this is going to be the first of, of a number of publications and analysis. Um, if you speak to Dawn, it was very hard to find people to write, I think, for this collection of works. And I think we have to be brave enough, audacious enough to lend our voice to, to the analysis, to shout out, because it really is an issue about how we live our lives. Um, it's not just a case study for me. It's it's life. It's, it's, it's me knowing that I have to make sure that I have a job that pays a private health insurance, because if not, I might not get treated if I go to a public hospital um, and I might die on a bed. And so that's how close it is to home. It's bridging the gaps between that experience and a policy gap, both at our national level, but our regional level, but also in terms of resisting a global oppression on all of us. And, and this has to be done together. I can feel the, the budding of a movement definitely a, a, against what is called the Wall Street consensus or financialization or the privatization of public services and goods. It's definitely in its budding uh, phase, but it's growing. And again, the feminist movement is at the forefront of that of that call and that agenda. Um, there's organizations like AW, um, Sir Awid, that's also looking at um, private sector and, and the binding treaty that's negotiated in Geneva, for example. Um, we have to engage our own, we have to build our own institutions, as horrible sometimes as they seem, their only way out of it. And we have to speak collectively across regions and within regions and across um, global South regions, there must be a solidarity building there if we're going to be able to, to push back. Uh, somebody asked about wanting to follow up on decolonizing development, which is a, something that's very close to my heart. Um, I recognize, especially from a Pan-African perspective, the fight for women's rights and women's equalities is is we're all fighting the same war, but the battles are very, very different. How um, oppression manifests is very different in the global South, in Africa, than it is from other regions and other countries. And I feel that it's imperative that we build our own narratives and really analyze our own, uh, both in our own regions, but across the global South as a region, um, before we're able to come to a global agenda. What is important to us in terms of fighting against, fighting for our taxing rights through tax justice is something that may not be at the top of the agenda for may, many of our sisters and brothers in the global north, for example. Um, they can be allies, but really we're the ones that wear the shoes and we know where it pinches and our voice needs to be at the forefront of that of that conversation. Decolonizing what that means, for example, where you know the trickle down effect in economics seems to be taking root in the developmental space as well, where international organizations get have historically gotten a bulk of the money and under the guise of capacity gaps um, our local or you know national or pan asian or pan african or pan latin american um, organizations get the drips and drabs of of that funding but i think the tides are turning and we're able to have more agency and we're pushing for more agency we're pushing for more 
um, funding that comes directly to us to be able to be audacious enough to dream about what alternative ways of organizing, what alternative ways of collective action could look like. Does it have to be in an organization? Can we work in collectives, especially now with COVID disrupting the way we, we knew things? How do we measure success, for example, and what does that mean in, in our own context, in our own realities, rather than just copy pasting frameworks that have been put on us from headquarters in the global north? I think these are questions that we're constantly needing to, to ask. Um, we must question you know, if we need to change the way in which we work and how we engage with ourselves and how do we share learnings and strategies between Kenya and India, between Kenya and Peru, for example, um, without letting our colonial languages hinder our ways of sharing. I think um, it's, it's a really, it's, it, it's something that speaks um, very closely to my heart. Uh, Mala again says, would you say civil society, including feminist groups are not doing much, they're providing experiments or they should, shouldn't, or they shouldn't as they need to be regulated? Um, I think in terms of civil society and feminist groups, our work and, and the space that I come from hasn't in, been in the, in the area of provi providing for actual services and goods. Our work has been in questioning, in advocacy, in influencing policies and influencing change in that way. And so I'm not so sure to what extent you can regulate freedom of, of speech and expression, um, also because we're only trying to reinstate uh, a social contract between state and citizen and bring back to that um, and push back against imperialist ways of profiteering from people's lives. Um, so yes, we're doing, there's a lot of feminist groups and a lot of women's rights organizations um, and civil society that do, are doing so much on so little um, to make sure that you know, the voices of, of everyday citizens, everyday Kenyans is heard and is that is questioning the way things are before we're run over by profiteering multinationals um, that are so extractive um, that we forget the centrality of what care means, of, of what these economies are supposed to be and who should be at the center of making these decisions. I think civil society is doing a really hard but most important job of recentering conversations around policy, around actual living, breathing people. And I think that that cannot be stated, um, that cannot that cannot be important. Like it has to be at the central point of our conversations. Dr. Yeah. Madhu Deepan wants to actually ask a question. Can I request uh, her to unmute and ask the question? Uh, some Somebody speaking, somebody speaking, I think. Nita? No, no, you can speak. We can hear you. But there's something, somebody going on speaking. I can hear that. Ah, okay, now, now no. Ah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for what you have, have spoken. Uh, but I don't know, my own voice seems to be echoing. I don't know what is happening. Yeah, your voice is echoing, but we still can still continue. You can just uh, uh, no. yeah. continue because it's echoing. I think it's a problem with your side. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to, I mean, I just wanted to thank uh, um, Crystal for the, for the presentation. And uh, I wanted to ask a question at the end, uh, which is, uh, which might seem a little surprising after the end of the talk and the questions being asked. Okay, I'll continue. I, I have no idea because I, I must have touched, I must have pressed something which I shouldn't have. Huh? Okay, so the question is, um, uh, it is that with the pandemic, the need for a strong public health system has become very clear. And uh, so that is why I was thinking with organizations like yours in Kenya, which seem to be very strong, both in terms of advocacy and impacting on policy. And you all have been agitating or you all have been, um, you know, fighting against the medical services 
Can you hear? Can you hear me? Yep, yep. Can you, can you hear me? I'm yes, so I can. Sorry. No, yes, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Yeah, so the question at the end does seem a little surprising, but I really wanted to ask you, why don't you all really ask for a strong public health system in, in Kenya? We've been, you, you know, you've been fighting against the medical services uh, scheme and in so many other ways you all have been agitating, but why not for a strong public health system? It has become very clear after the pandemic. Sorry, I'm so sorry. Mm. Thank you. Thank you so much for your question. And that's exactly the central point of what we're agitating for. Uh, the organization that I'm with is not Kenyan, just to be clear. This was just a case study. We work on African regional policy and global policy influence from a pan-African feminist perspective. Um, but I hear you. And, and this is exactly what I mean when we need to make sure that struggles are speaking to each other. The fight for tax justice means that we're able to release financing that is able to finance our public public services in terms of health and education. Um, with $100 billion leaving the continent, if we were going to allow not, not allow so much to leave, we would have the finances to be able to have a quality public, public health system. Um, the push for making sure that our doctors are paid well enough, that there is affordable drugs, I think, there was a comparison that the cost of drugs in Kenya is seven times higher than what it costs in India, for example. So the question around pushing the price for that down for public services, the question around um, infrastructure for public services like hospitals, um, you know, in some areas, women have to walk seven kilometers to find the closest um, clinic or facility for maternal services. Um, there's there's all these, all these um, points of resistance and, and points of, of advocacy, but also a push against oppressive ways and, and the privatization of life in general um, that we need to begin to connect. They're all speaking to the same thing in terms of the centrality of public health and the, and the fact that we need to uphold it and we need to finance it. But again, the question of public health cannot be spoken without speaking of a financing um, question. Um, with it being theoretically on paper in our constitution as a right means nothing if we're not able to adequately finance it. And this adequately financing our health system is so intricately tied in with a global economic um, financing um, landscape that means that it's skewed and is, is extractive from us and that privatizes, but also hinders our own governments from being able to spend on these so badly needed services and goods like health hospitals and schools and water and, and transport. Um, COVID really did bring this to a fore. Uh, our, our, our transport system, for example, is almost entirely privatized. And so even in terms of regulating how many people can go into a bus or a minivan, it's questionable if government has no control. It's all private sector owned. And so how do you how do you regulate? How do you regulate that if if that's in the hands of private sector? So they all begin to speak to each other. And like you say, COVID has really brought out the need for a public health care system and public systems in general, whether it's in education or transport or the provision of water or housing to some extent, um, and what that means for a healthy population really that is happy and living dignified lives is central to the conversation. Um, so yes, I totally agree the push is is in upholding a public health care system, questions around how that's financed and questions around how we're pushing back from this growing wave of privatization of our facilities is also um, one that cannot be ignored. But thank, then thank you so much, yes. Thank you so much, thank you so much. I hope there are no more questions. Please unmute if you have any question, comments. I think with the, you had enough questions, Crystal. So, I haven't spoken for so long in a long time. <laughs> so let me thank you, Crystal, for this very insightful and uh, interesting, uh, you know, discussion. Thank you. It was it was really special to share and learning and hear such interesting connections, even just beyond the healthcare case study um, yes. from our Huduma number. Um, we share so much in terms of history, um, but also what we're going through now. I wish there was more spaces that we could 
build our solidarity and share, um, yeah, share strategies and experiences. I, the, I'm sure there is a lot of space now for us to come together, bring uh, some solidarity in terms of all the different efforts that are happening at different countries, at different regional levels. I think we should all be now looking forward to those kind of call the of solidarities. Yeah. So, and I think the 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 message from today's thing is that we should be advocating for provisioning of uh, uh, public sector sort of provisioning of public sector services in terms of, at least in terms of the social sectors that we are now having faced with privatization. So yeah. thank you, thank you, uh, Crystal, and thank you all the participants for a very interesting conversation. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. Thank you and have a lovely day. Thank you. Same to you. And Nita, did you want me to stay on a little bit to have a chat or we should get on email for that? I think we can get on to email for that. Great. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Have a lovely day. And thank you so much for, for having me. Thank you.